<laughs> so welcome to the session, Introduction to Serverless. It's called, uh, I believe it's called Drupal and Serverless in the program. I will mention Drupal, don't worry. Don't worry. Just so you know, there will be buzzwords. A lot of them. So who am I? Please sit down, Nick. There's, there's, a, there's a seat right there. Nick. Thank you. <laughs> so who am I? I'm Robert, and I'm a technical director at MediaMox. And if you don't know, we're quite big. We have over 14 offices, over a thousand moms. I honestly don't know how many. And we do digital. I'm uh, also next to being technical director, I'm also PHP department lead. I'm known as the beer monk, and I'm a proud Windows user, which I think is these days is uh, it's uncommon. <laughs> Shell of hands, who so uses cloud for, for production workloads? That's some of you, okay. I expected more, but that's, that's cool. This is something I hear a lot there's no cloud, it's just someone else's computer. Um, I disagree with this a lot, because cloud is not just a computer, it's an entire infrastructure, and it, it, for you it doesn't matter if there's one machine, if it's a thousand or maybe 10,000, and if 100 machines break down a day, you don't notice any of this. And that's why I think you cannot compare it just with another PC and a data center that you might work with yourself. So I want to talk to you about today about serverless and uh, did anyone hear a few about serverless before? A few of you, anyone using it? No one yet, all right. Then I hope you will be really excited to try it in the end. So of course serverless doesn't mean there's no servers because obviously code needs to be executed somewhere or service needs to run somewhere. I think the authors of the serverless framework put it in a really nice way like you have wireless internet, but still there's, eventually there's a wire somewhere that needs to connect it. So and it's the same thing with servers, there are still servers involved. Uh, for me personally, it means that I can focus on writing code and I don't have to worry about all the infrastructure that's behind it. So I can do my deep sleep code repeat. Uh, so when, when is something considered serverless? Um, people are still debating this. After, still, years after serverless became a thing, people are still debating this. In general, it means that there's no service to provision or manage. So, if you have your own VPS or something, you need to put, put an OS on there, or if you're using containers, you need to put the runtime in there, keep it up to date. With serverless, this is not the case. You either put your code in there, or you put your data in there, and it's all managed. It all scales based on load. So, if you, for instance, have one visitor, it should work, of course, fine. If you have 10,000 visitors, it should still work without doing any additional scaling yourself. The cost is based on precise usage. So if you talk about database or storage, you might uh, pay money by the amount of gigabytes that you're using or storing. For compute, it means you are paying for the amount of milliseconds of code you're executing. It's also highly available and fault tolerant by default. So again, like I said, the cloud, it, it's, it means not just a machine, it means that they take care of the entire infrastructure for you. So you don't have to worry if there's a machine that's failing, they will take care of it, that it will run their code anyway. So serverless basically consists of two parts. It's either backend as a service, which is called BAS, and it could be storage, like S3 or Google Cloud Storage, or databases, like maybe DynamoDB or Amazon. Queues, I think everyone, uh, a lot of people use queues nowadays. There are great serverless solutions for this. Messaging, and basically there you, you can get anything. You can also have search engines which run serverless, or even unmanaged. Uh, and another big part of what I'm focusing on today is functions as a service. Uh, this is called FAS. Basically what you do is you pick your runtime, so you choose like Node 10 or Python 3, or uh, some other language that you want to, want to work in. You write your function, and that's basically it. You need to just need to execute your function. But what can you actually do with this? Because this sounds really good, but what can you do? So common use cases for serverless are websites or static websites. I'm not sure if someone went to the Gatsby talk uh, in, uh, in the previous slot. 
Um, that's something that would be serverless. If you generate your static site, put it on an S3 bucket, for instance, and you don't have any servers to run. You can manage 10,000 visitors per second. It doesn't matter. The only limit is what Amazon is. Uh, what Amazon, the limit of Amazon is your only limit. APIs on microservices, you can put those in, in functions. You can do data processing, content mani manipulation, so you can have something like uh, content moderation in here, or maybe uh, create videos or audio files. Also chatbots, they rely heavily on, uh, on these functions. And email handling, like I'm pretty sure that some of you had some project where you need to listen to a client or a customer sending an email and then respond on that. And you can either like pull the email inbox or you can trigger a function that would, uh, that would be executed if the email was received. And Internet of Things, uh, so there's a lot of devices that you can, that can broadcast metrics and you can store them in those databases. So containers, we have containers, right? Containers are awesome. But it's, it's not the same. And I hope it isn't too much, but on the left, on the left side you see a VM. I think most of you might be using VMs uh, or containers. So you see that a VM is it, it, infrastructure is provided. So you have a box and you need to uh, put your operating system on there. And there you put your runtime, so that could be PHP. And then you need to write your application, which would be Drupal. And then you write your code, which would be maybe your custom modules. For a container, this is easier already because there's a host that would manage the containers. So basically you don't have to worry much about your operating system depending on what kind of container you use. But something you do usually need to provide or update is your runtime. So if you're using a container with PHP, you need to make sure that you're using the latest one and make sure it gets patched. And then you also still have to write your application and your code. And then there's something in the middle which I don't, I won't be touching it too much uh, this session, but there's something called platform as a service. And basically it already manages the application. So you, uh, or it, uh, it already manages the runtime. So you only update, upload your entire application so that it could be Drupal or Symfony or Express. And then you have to write your own functions. And on the right side, functions as a service, everything on them is already provided. So in the case of Node, they already have Expressia running and you only have the tiny function that actually responds and that's the thing that you need to write yourself. So as you can see, for functions, there's a lot less to worry about. <coughs> so functions as a service, I think it's good to just show you some code, see how easy it is. So this would, this would be a, a hello world in Python. I think everyone would be able to read this, and of course, if I execute it, it's, it's not that exciting. But you can see the hello world. And um, this is the same example, but then in Node.js. And you can see, you can also use the, the async await here. In this example, it doesn't add much. And I can just execute this and it will show me the hello world. It's pretty simple. And of course, you won't be using this in real life, but it at least shows you how simple it is, because this is the only thing that you put in your IDE. So how can you execute functions that you write. Well, there's a lot of ways to do this. You can either do it by push. So this could be the HTTP example that I just showed you. So you have a URL, your function executes, and you get the response immediately. This is also the same case for chatbots because you immediately want to get a reply because you need to know what's sent to the, to the end user. Authentication, maybe do some token-based validation on an endpoint. You would also need to have a direct response. Or you can also invoke it yourself by using the AWS APIs, or I put AWS there because I work most with AWS. Or you have events, it would be triggered by an event, and this is asynchronous. So whenever you write a file in a storage bucket, or there's a row written to a database, or you receive an email, you can also trigger daily, or, or even by minute you can trigger a cron. Or resource state change, so this is pretty complex, but Whenever you maybe launch uh, an instance or a server in your network on AWS, for instance, you can also execute a function. And this is something that, uh, for instance, Netflix uses internally because if someone launches uh, a server, then the function is triggered and it checks if there's no 
ports open that are not supposed to be open, and if there is, they immediately terminate the server. It's pretty powerful. Something related to the events is polling, and this would be mostly for queues and streams. And it's very similar to the events. However, for events, if you put a thousand files in, a, in, a, in your storage bucket, it would immediately trigger a thousand executions of your code. And for polling, they basically do it every, they do it in batches. So there won't be a thousand functions running, but there might be running 50 at a time and they will execute and then get, get the data from the queue or stream every few seconds. Some tips and tricks when doing serverless. A function should usually do one thing. It's the same as you write your own code right now. It doesn't matter which language, a function should do one thing. Also functions shouldn't call other functions. There are some circumstances where you might need this, but usually you don't. Avoid connection-based services, this is really important. Uh, if you're doing something like serverless and want to scale up, have a lot of scaling, then don't use MySQL for instance, because it's a connection-based service and you can better go with a cloud native solution like DynamoDB for instance. And focus on asynchronous, which for me was pretty difficult because I'm uh, also a PHP developer, so we don't usually work with asynchronous, but for this you should really focus on that. Also this is really cool, you can pack it with binaries, so you can maybe put FFmpeg in your in your package and execute FFmpeg and create a video or an audio file. I'll get back to an example a little bit later. And you can also play with memory size. And this is pretty important because with, with a function, you cannot use like your CPU, for instance. This is something you do with, with a VM. You use the amount of CPUs and the amount of memory. For a function, you usually only pick the amount of memory that you need. And with more memory comes more performance. And we had a project where we had low amount of memory and it would take a really long time to render a video. And then we started playing with the memory size. We increased it to the maximum, which makes it more expensive. Because more memory means that it's more expensive. Um, however, it was, in the end, it was so fast that we only had like a fraction of the time needed. So it was actually cheaper to have the high amount of memory. So that's something you can uh, you can benchmark and then pick your number. Also, there's limitations when it comes to serverless and some some pitfalls. Uh, a function is stateless, which luckily we in PHP that's usually what we are used to with, uh, working with. And they're short-lived, so you can have on AWS Lambda a function can run 15 minutes max, and I would recommend you not to do it because it would be on Lambda it would be very expensive to do. There's better services for that, so keep it as short as possible. Something with serverless that you have with functions running can be cold start. So if you don't run your function for a very long time, it they will basically remove your your the, like the, the stuff that's running behind the scenes. They will remove it, and once someone starts to execute it, they first need to recover it, bring it up, and then eventually execute. And it's called a cold start. And it can be up to seconds. Also, a snowball effect. Um, imagine that if you're um, triggering a function for every file that you're putting in your, in your storage bucket, and by doing that, you also generate a new file on your storage bucket. Then it will, you will create an endless loop of functions that execute, and it will be uh, it will cost you a lot of money. Uh, this actually happened to me at some point. And luckily, the system detected it and stopped it. But this is uh, really dangerous. And also keep in mind that you pay for precise usage only, but it doesn't always have to be cheaper. If you have a steady amount of users coming in, then probably the traditional way of doing it might, might be cheaper. So some example architectures, so you have an idea what you can actually do with this. Uh, this is a website we, uh, this is uh, maybe the most visited uh, website at our office. Uh, it's called Is It All Beer Tide? So it's for the non Dutchies, Is It Beer Time? We like our beers at the ASU office. And uh, 10 years ago, I decided to create a website for it, which basically counts down until um, 4.30 Friday afternoon, and then it changes to yes, and then we can drink our beers. 
And I saw a presentation on Google Firebase, and I thought immediately, like, I should rewrite the airtime to run on Firebase. And uh, as you can see, there's uh, the users, and they basically load their pages from the from the hosting, and they can they are also directly connected to a real time database. So they can with a web socket they can immediately get changes that are done in the database. And I can as an admin I can authenticate myself using Facebook, Twitter, or Google. And I'm also I also created an API for it, <coughs> and that API is getting data from Untapped. Is anyone using Untapped here? All right, you can all add me later. Uh, basically, it's an app that you can you can check in your beers uh, at a specific location. And I thought it would be funny to do a check checker figure at the bottom of the website with the latest check-ins. Um, so I will show you the website. So you can see it's still counting down. We have an early beer time at four today because a colleague of mine is with the office for ten years. Um, here I'm already already logged in and. Yeah, people are probably watching this live, so they will be really excited if I start changing the time. So let's say it, it will be beer time at 3 o'clock, and I save it, then you see it already updates. And it will do this real time for any connected user. So let's put that back. Otherwise, people will actually start opening their beers at 3 o'clock because the site is pretty leading in at the office. Um, I'm not sure if you noticed, but I put here button, and uh, this is something that was uh, like the uh, fun side project. This is an actual, we call it the instant beer time button. And uh, I can, uh, there's key authentication. Because <laughs> otherwise any, any idiot will stop by at, the, at, the, at my desk and press the button and it will be beer time all the time. So um, I hope it works. I connected it to Dubai for here, so I will, it shows a small LED light, so I know that it's actually powered. It will connect to the Wi-Fi. LED shows up, I press the button, and then in a few seconds it should show that it's beer time. Please, demo gods. <laughs> yes, there it is. <laughs> but that's, uh, that's funny, a uh, fun story. Um, I also connected it to the Sonos at the office. Let me turn this off. <laughs> People are getting very excited at the office now. Um, I also connected to the Sonos, so there will be playing for the Dutch East Coast Mail, which the Dolberton and Leeds and will start playing at the Sonos sound system. Um, <laughs> but uh, the fun stuff is that this site actually cost me five euro cents a month to run. Just because it's so cheap, it's, it's mostly static, um, um, you only pay for what you use. So it's, it's, it's very, very cheap. Otherwise, you would need to have a VM, which would most cheap VMs are usually around 10 euros a month, so it saves a lot of money. Something at, uh, at home I created, because to show you it's not only about big stuff or, or actual websites, you can also use it for smaller stuff. So I created, uh, I have a consumer home line, uh, a consumer line at home, uh, but I want to connect to my VPN using a host name, so it's like vpn.mydomain.nl, and I want to make sure that it's always pointing to the correct IP address. So what I did is I created a, um, a cron on my NAS and it's calling uh, a lambda function every 15 minutes. Of course, that contains my actual IP address and I will just call the hosting provider to update my DNS records. And then if my IP ever changes, it did happen sometime. And then within 15 minutes, it's already configured or already configured correctly. Um, and basically, I of course, bit smaller, but this this is basically how the function looks. So I have some token validation which I put uh, at the top to make sure that no one else can call it. Um, I get the source IP from the event request context, and then I eventually call the the uh, hosting provider to update the DNS record. This would this cost like two cents a month to run this every fifteen minutes. Uh, something also related for home is uh, I have paperless home, so whenever I get a document, I scan it with OCR and then I throw away the document. And I put everything with backups in an S3 bucket. And I want to know what's happening in my bucket. So whenever something happens in the bucket, I put it in the queue. And every morning at 8, I empty the queue and send myself like an email, like this has changed in your bucket, like a mutation uh, email. 
pretty simple. But what it does, the, the event that's actual, or the function that stores the event, this, this is the actual function. So I'm logged into SQS, which is a simple queuing service, and I just add the message there with the entire event in there. Um, it's, it's Python, it's not PHP, but I, I believe that everyone can read this. And whenever in the morning, whenever I call the function, which is triggered by cron, it will get the message from the queue. If there's nothing, you know, well, there's nothing to do. If there's something in there, I create an email body and I just send it to myself using simple email service from Amazon. So it's, it's also small things you can use at home to, to fiddle around and make life easier. This is again also beer related. <laughs> Not sure why, but. Uh, there's this buddy of mine, he's crazy about going to beer events and he always is uh, uh, creating all lists of what kind of beers they're serving. So I thought let's, there, there should be an easier way for him to do this. So I created a small app well, for the untapped users, they know this site. Uh, so I grab the link, put it in here, and then it will eventually show Yes, there it is. So it will automatically autofill the entire sheet and he doesn't have to do manually copy pasting all the stuff. So how does this work? Uh, we have the spreadsheet and whenever something is put in the spreadsheet, I put a small script in Google Apps Script and it gets triggered where something happens in the spreadsheet and it will enter the data into the real-time database from uh, Google Cloud, uh, Google Firebase it will detect, like, there's a new record in the database, it will fetch the data from untapped, put it in the database, and also synchronize it back to the sheet. And I could use this to actually create a small um, front-end application that would also list the beers, but that was my intention to do what I, I basically was too lazy, so there's no actual other app using this data, but I, I could have. But it shows that serverless is not only about websites and stuff, it can also be something like to or the complete uh, your spreadsheet, for instance. This, I was talking about audio rendering before, like attaching an event pack. But this is uh, an actual campaign that we ran at the company. I believe it was like two years ago already. It was a static website, so we had static HTML and JavaScript in an S3 bucket. We put CloudFront in front of that, which is a content delivery network. People would just be able to load all the static data, and whatever they had, like, a, there was like a form like an experience where people were answering questions and in the end of the flow you would receive uh, like a personalized audio file. So what would happen is someone would submit the form and eventually it would trigger a function that would call FFMP to create the user's personalized audio file and we would put that file on the on S3 bucket but the front end already knew because it was part of the response like all right this file will end up at this location so after around 20 seconds, it would just check on S3, like, does the file exist? And if it was, well, then the user could download the file and the flow was complete. And if it was not, then the, the front end would wait another five seconds and try again until it was done. And using this, we could ser easily serve over 10,000 visitors a day uh, without any scaling or managing or, or monitoring. This is the most complicated example, uh, just to show you that it's, we also use this for real big stuff. Uh, this is a game API for, uh, for a pretty big client uh, of ours which we did a mobile application for, a game, uh, game application. Uh, I won't go into too much details, but um, basically that we have HTTP endpoints which start funct trigger functions to actually do logic in the game uh, that gets added to a stream and the stream gets listened by other functions which might decide that based on your profile you get rewards and such. And if you might get rewards, we would send you that uh, asynchronously using WebSockets to the actual device. As a database, we're using Redis as a persistent storage for all the profile data. And at the bottom, you can see here we have content management, which in, in our example, uh, in this case, it's a Symfony framework with an admin tool, uh, but that easily could have been Drupal. So you can have your content management and we basically export all the content that we have to our Redis database and from there on we have a really quick way of loading all the data from 
Redis using the serverless functions. But I think this shows that you can combine different techniques to get a, a good end result. So if you want to get started yourself, um, there's many providers which you can do this. I, like I said, I have mostly experience with, with AWS and Google, but there's a lot of other providers supporting this as well. Firebase, like I said, from Google, it's a pretty complete solution. So it has a, a database and storage. Uh, it's, it works with web and app, iOS and Android. There's a really good CLI tools, super easy to use. You just do Firebase in it, it will ask you some questions. You can start coding, you type Firebase deploy, and it will deploy. It's really that simple. They currently support Node.js and Python, so no PHP. But uh, it, it shouldn't be too hard to learn a bit of Python. Uh, something I can really recommend is serverless framework. There's a great open source variant of it. And it, it, it's a bit of, little bit uh, more difficult, I would say, than Firebase. However, this is way more powerful. It's, uh, again, a CLI tool. It works with YAML configuration. It works on, on most of the providers you just saw. And of course, one provider supports more stuff than the other. It's multilingual, so you can either, you can use this with, uh, with all the languages that you can think of, basically. It supports local testing and streaming logs, so if you're executing your function, you can actually get, see the logs, what happens, and do debugging. It's a really, really great framework. And the great part is that you can try this for, basically, for free. Like I said, Firebase, as long as you don't use any external APIs, you can have, uh, I believe, one million invocations of a function every month. You can have one gigabyte of database storage and traffic every month, one gigabyte of hosting space for free. So the only reason why I'm paying for beer time is because I'm using Untapped, otherwise it would have been entirely for free. And also with AWS, if you're not using AWS, you have like two million invocations a month for free. So it's really, really easy to, to get started with this. So serverless PHP, uh, we're PHP dev, so we always try to do stuff with PHP, if it's suitable or not, at least as my experience. Um, pretty recently, Amazon uh, created something called Runtime API and Lambda Layers. You don't have to dig to know the details about it, but natively, Lambda does not, not support PHP, which is unfortunate. Uh, however, using those Runtime APIs, people can create their own runtimes for Lambda and people have created runtimes for Bash, C++, Rust, and also PHP. So we can actually start doing PHP on Lambda now, which is pretty awesome. And uh, there's, uh, if you want to actually do that, I recommend you to look at Breath. And it allows you to deploy serverless PHP apps. And it only supports AWS Lambda right now, but that's great to get started. And to show you, this is, this is the actual thing I had to write to do a Hello World on Lambda with Breath. So, if we click the link again, you will see it will display how it works again. So it's, it's pretty easy. Um, if you want to do read PHP on Google Cloud Platform, uh, you're out of luck. They don't support PHP. However, they have recently created a tool called Google Cloud Run, and that, that allows you to upload a, upload a container. And that container would be managed in a serverless way. So. If, if your service won't run, if no one is no one is visiting your page, it will cost you nothing. And if someone will start visiting your page, it will boot up the container and serve the page. So it's not entirely serverless because you need to manage your own PHP in such a container. But still, this is this is really exciting. Of course, you're all dying to know if you can do like run Drupal without servers uh, or serverless. Uh, and I can tell you that uh, I fiddled around with it. And there we go. Uh, this is actually running on, 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 uh, on AWS Lambda. And it will also show you the contact page. So this is now running uh, on, on Amazon Lambda and CloudFront, which I think, and S3, which I think is pretty cool. If you actually would submit the form, it would, it would break uh, because I didn't put more time in it than showing the homepage. But I'm pretty confident that it, it, it can actually be done which I think is pretty, pretty exciting. What you can also do, like I just mentioned, uh, create your own Docker container with Drupal and put it on Google Cloud Run. Still, you have the benefit of having no cost if no one is using it. 
You can also use Drupal in the headless way. So like I just showed you in the game API example, you can run your Drupal instance as you do always, and whenever content changes, you export it to another database or a search uh, engine or such, and have another API query that instead of Drupal. Or the static site generator, which was a great uh, example at the previous session about Gatsby. It will take your Drupal site, you use Drupal what it's good at, doing all the content management, Afterwards, you, whenever you want to make a build, you convert it into a static website, put it on a bucket, and you can handle any kind, any amount of visitors that you like. Also, added advantages is that if there's any, if there's like a Drupal get and free, you won't be affected since no one will be touching your Drupal instance. Um, Servers plus plus, a little advanced uh, to give you more idea what's more possible or more possibilities. Um, it's called Edge Functions, and I believe that this is uh, I think the example from AWS again, CloudFront. However, I think that uh, there's other major Edge uh, or CDN providers also supporting this. Uh, basically, at every every time you can, every moment you can execute a function. So when the request comes in without hitting the cache, or when it actually goes to origin, when it comes back from the origin, and when it comes back from the cache, so you can have a function there if you like. And what can you do with this? Because this sounds pretty crazy. But you can actually do URL rewrites with this. So whenever someone hits a specific URL, you can redirect them before hitting any kind of server. Uh, or rewrites, but you can also do it with redirects. Uh, you can set maybe headers or do validation of headers. You can do A-B testing, uh, which is a really powerful uh, use case. Like you can detect if someone already has a cookie if they don't, you can assign a cookie, and then based on the cookie, you can uh, maybe inject certain types of content. Image resizing, you can maybe put your original image in your S3 bucket, and whenever someone tries to get a version of a file, like a dimensional file, which isn't there yet, you can generate it on the fly, store it, and then put it in cache, and the next time it will be served from cache. Or authentication, like you can have your token validation or uh, offer validation. Also something that I'd like to touch really briefly is workflows, because all, having all the functions on its own is really powerful, but like I said, like usually functions don't call functions, uh, and people start to get really creative, like if I have my function and it will transform a piece of data, and then I will move it to another bucket, and then another function is executed, and then it became really weird. So uh, the smart people from Microsoft and Amazon came up with a solution for this. And uh, basically it's, it's, it's a workflow. So I have this small example where maybe someone upload, uploads an image, you extract the data from the image, see if it's actually a valid image type, yes or no. So if it's not a valid image type on the right side, you say, well, it's not supported, we stop there. If it is supported, we maybe store the image data. And then in parallel we can send the photo to recognition or another vision API, which will detect like what, this, what is actually in this image. So in this case, mountains, people, and snow. And the other function might create a thumbnail. And then in the end, it's done and you have your end result. And you don't have to do all the wiring yourself. Um, to add to this, if you're really interested in how this works, I got a, um, something we created recently, which just got live. If you're really interested in it, find me afterwards, because I got a really interesting use case, which is way too much uh, to discuss during this session. So, conclusions. Advantages of serverless, are you focused on code? There's less logistics, so you can just start writing an app, just play around, it's like Lego, I would say, for developers. And you can just create something small, it doesn't cost you 10 euros a month for just trying something because you don't pay for idle. It scales with use, so if for some reason your application becomes really popular, then it will automatically scale. Also pricing will scale, let's keep that in mind. And it's, uh, it's fault tolerant, and it's pretty easy to get started, especially I would say with Google Firebase. Of course there's some disadvantages, it's not always cheaper. So like I said, if you have a steady amount of visitors coming in every day, then probably this doesn't add too much. Also, it doesn't mean that there's no DevOps, because if you just fiddle around for yourself, you can do the serverless deploy command or the Firebase deploy command. Uh, but if you start to get serious with multiple environments, 
you still need to have some kind of deployment pipeline set up for it. You, of course, you need to learn new tools, so potentially a new, new language. And there will be vendor locking, because if you start with AWS and you're using their queue, for instance, there's no one-on-one -on -one, uh, direct uh, product from Google that you can swap. So this is something you need to, uh, to consider as well. And scaling is not infinite. Like the Gain API, we, uh, I showed you the uh, diagram of, we, I believe we tested it uh, with uh, 4,000 uh, calls per second. And eventually it started breaking because we hit a limit at AWS. It was a really specific combination of things, but there are limits to this still. So I would say that Turbo is really awesome, but it's no silver bullet. Use the right tool for the job. And it's perfectly fine to combine different tools. So you can have your Drupal, you can have your serverless function to do certain things, make it easier. In the end, just combine it. Okay, that's it. Any questions? So the question is for the ones that are listening, um, is how does the, the connection work with, uh, with the beer app? So is there like polling or is it, uh, is it something smarter? Well, I can say it's something smarter. Uh, it sets up a WebSocket uh, connection with the database. So it's directly listening to database changes. So whenever something comes in, I'm not sure if I can show you. I was really lame to just put it all in here. Um, but here you can see, um, can you see the screen? So here you can see I'm creating a reference to site slash, or in this case, media long slash public. And whenever something happens in that database, I get this callback. And then what I'm doing is I'm updating the data that is part of this snapshot. So I'm also getting all the values that are changed in the database. And then I'm basically just setting all the data and uh, updating the profile and check-ins. So whenever I change it, it's immediately reflected to all the, connect the connected clients without any polling or anything. So it's incredibly fast. And I believe the, this is the, the real-time database from Firebase. It can scale up to 10,000 users <coughs> concurrently. Um, and uh, they also have a new service called Firestore and that can even go higher. Just answer your question. Yes. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the development workflow when you build things further? So if I can, the question is, can I tell something about the development workflow? Um, it's basically the same, but it's, you of course, you work with different tools and what you, it's more test driven, I would say because you don't want to upload your code every time and execute all the, the, the endpoints. So what I would recommend to do, and this is also described in the serverless documentation, the serverless framework documentation, that what you can do is also to make it more uh, provider agnostic, at least to try to do it, is to have your code being separated from the actual function, and then you can locally test your, like your JavaScript or your Python code. And then, we, like we have just pipelines using Jenkins, so whenever we want to do actual builds, um, it's basically the same as usual. We get all the code, we package it, and then we do the, run the deploys, like put the environment variables on its place, and then do the deploy. Answer your question? Yeah. More questions? Uh, would you like to actually uh, recommend um, uh, this for uh, a regular corporate website or so? If I would recommend it for a corporate website. Um, yeah. Well, it depends, of course, on, the, on what the website is about. Like, if there's this, like, highly interactive with a lot of forms, then, then it might not work, or e-com might not work. Uh, but still, there's, uh, I mentioned e-com, but you can also have a static website and use something like Shopify. So your cart basically is a piece of JavaScript, which you buy somewhere else, because then it would be, like, a service that you buy. 
but then you could definitely have uh, have your own experience, which you have all statically generated. It, it could definitely be. But what is uh, the 50 minutes you told us about? Uh, what actually is the Thing that you didn't infer? Yes, yeah, so the 15-minute limit. Like, that would be something like calling as a event back, for instance. So if you have a lot, a lot of workload, or like you want to generate like a high-definition movie, uh, if that would not fit in 50 minutes, then your lambda will just shut down in 50 minutes, and it will say it was out of time. Uh, but if you have, for instance, like a hello world that takes milliseconds, so if you, I, I think I, I would say that you would never need to have a lambda function that runs 15 minutes. If so, then you're probably using the wrong service. It's from my personal experience, at least. Any more questions? Yes. Uh, is there a way to replicate uh, swap solutions? So, for example, I know Netlify it allows you uh, effectively to replicate their services, and you do them in that one function in the local environment. Is there a way to? So to some of the questions, like can you run these things locally, basically the question there. Um, yeah, there, there, there's great plugins for serverless framework at least, and also for Firebase there's uh, a local serve option where you can test your local site uh, on your own PC. For AWS specifically, there's a lot of tools from AWS that allow you to uh, have DynamoDB running locally, for instance, and you can seed it with a snapshot and run all your code locally. So there's there are a lot of tools to do this, yes, definitely. I would still recommend you to always have your regular stages that you always have your regular environment. So just have a development and a staging and a production environment and make sure your your teams also test every of those environments before actually pushing it live. So basically there's not much of a difference if you compare it to your other projects. No more questions? All right, then I want to thank you for your attention.